Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary, and this is part of our series on world religions. And our topic is Buddhism, and our distinguished guest is Harold Netlin, who is coming to us live uh, over uh, technology and Skype from Deerfield, Illinois, where he is Professor of Philosophy, Religion, and Intercultural Studies at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. You know, we could almost write on our titles uh, next to one another to see who has the longest one. But anyway, uh, Harold, it's great to see you, and we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Well, thank you, Daryl. It's good to be with you. Yeah. Now, let's. Uh, uh, we're going to talk about Buddhism, which is the fourth largest religion in the world after Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism, uh, about somewhere between, I think, 400 million and 500 million adherents. So it's a major religion. Uh, whose roots are in Asia, but uh, now has become a global religion. And before we begin, I just want people to understand uh, your background, uh, because you've ended up in the classroom at Trinity, but you haven't been in Illinois all your life. Uh, No, I haven't. I was actually born in Japan. My parents were uh, missionaries to Japan. And so uh, through age 18, most of my life was in Japan. And uh, then I went back uh, as an adult for about 10 years with my wife. So much of my life has been lived in that country. Uh, Japan is Buddhist. Uh, It's a certain kind of Buddhism we can talk about in due course. But uh, because of my upbringing in Japan, I was uh, aware of and interested in Buddhism from an early age. In graduate school, I had the uh, I did my doctoral study at uh, Claremont in California, and uh, among the professors I studied with was a uh, Japanese uh, Zen Buddhist, hmm. Abe Masao, and so uh, from that perspective, I was able to get a little bit more of the academic scholarly uh, dimension into it. And then over the years, I've just been fascinated by Buddhism as a religion in Asia, and then more recently as it has come uh, to North America and to Europe as well. Now, what's interesting about Buddhism, uh, and I'm just using it for comparative purposes, because initially what we want to do is talk about kind of the nature of this faith, um, is that it's not a it's not a doctrinal faith in the way we think about Christianity or even uh, Judaism or even Islam to that extent. Uh, it, it's more... Uh, a way of life and a philosophy of life. Would that be a fair contrast to make about what Buddhism is? Uh, Buddhists themselves will often say it's a philosophy, it's not a religion. And that gets you into discussions about, you know, what's the difference between a religion and a philosophy. But it clearly has a a particular way of understanding reality, uh, our knowledge, and... um, you also have to distinguish with Buddhism between the Buddhism of the scholar, the uh, uh, those who study the texts, who meditate and uh, follow the high tradition, and then the folk Buddhist, the laity. And oftentimes there's quite a difference between the two. Uh, but yes, among the uh, uh, elite, the scholars, the academics, uh, they, they resist calling it a religion. It's a way of life. It's a philosophy. Yeah, and... and as was the case when we were discussing Shintoism, uh, the difference between kind of the history and the development uh, of it and then the actual practice of what's happening on the ground. You're dealing more with a spectrum and a variety of things with a certain orientation than you are everyone who's a Buddhist kind of belongs in the same bucket. Is that fair? Uh, that's right. Um, Buddhism emerges in India, and uh, we're actually not even – certain on the dates of Gautama the Buddha. He was a historical figure, but uh, depending upon whether you're Chinese, Japanese, or European American, there's a full century difference in the dates that are given. But it emerges in India and then spreads south and uh, east throughout South Asia, up into uh, China, Tibet, Korea, Japan, Japan. 
And then in the 19th century, it comes to Hawaii, North America, and Europe. Uh, there's enormous variety. And you also have to factor into that uh, what we call Buddhist modernism. Uh, so Buddhism in the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, in its encounter with the West, with Christianity, with modernization, really becomes something of a different religion than it had been in the previous centuries. Yeah, my sense is in the reading that I've done is that it's a very adaptable approach to life, and so it it, it almost morphs in relationship to what it comes alongside of. Um, and, and so that is part of what's producing your variety. That's right. Uh, you mentioned earlier it's not heavily doctrinal. Um, there are some clear doctrinal pillars, but you can – uh, redu reduce those to the Four Noble Truths, the Noble Eightfold Path, um, a few key concepts about no self, impermanence, uh, and then it has really adapted to the local conditions. So when it goes up into China, it embraces uh, local Chinese religious traditions. And in China, the Buddhist tradition, along with Taoism, uh, produces what we call Zen. And uh, so Zen is a very different uh, East Asian adaptation uh, of what had been earlier Indian Buddhism. Uh, it embraces the local cultures, the local traditions, unlike Christianity, where we've tended to have a sharp conflict uh, with the local religious traditions. Uh, Buddhism has tended to embrace them and then adapt accordingly. Hmm. Well, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the roots. You said there's about a century's difference uh, in terms of where it comes from, and that it did emerge out of India, northern India. My my, there the official dates that I have for uh, Gautama is uh, 563 to 483. But there are people who think he may have lived actually a, a century later than that, uh, and so so we're talking about. Uh, in the period, really at the, if I can make a comparison, almost at the time when the end of the Old Testament is being written. Um, and, and, and so if you want a chronological comparison, that's where we're at in terms of the origins of this faith. That's right. That's right. And um, modern historians of early Buddhism are actually fairly skeptical about the roots because the first uh, written texts we have on Buddhism are from about the mid-first century B.C. Hmm. in the southern island of Sri Lanka. Hmm. And these don't contain so much the teachings or the life of the Buddha. There are monastic rules how to live in the monastery. And then the, the teachings and the lives of the Buddha come a century or more after that. So there's quite a gap between the dates of Gautama and the first written text that we have. Well, since you've mentioned monasteries, before we get into kind of what the approach to life is, maybe we ought to talk a little bit about that. There's, there's a feel in reading about Buddhism, particularly the early history and the way it's structured, that there's almost a, a withdrawal element associated with it in terms of how the most pious Buddhists live. Um, is that a correct impression of what's going on, particularly in the relationship to the monasteries, et cetera? I know what little travel I've done in Asia when I've been to Thailand, for example, and I see these what look to be like schools or monasteries. I'm not even sure what they are. It does have this, this kind of uh, withdrawn community feel to it. Yes, you're right. Um, near as we can tell, the early Buddhist communities – um, did tend to withdraw. Uh, the idea was, uh, the goal in Buddhism uh, is to uh, break the causal chain that is uh, driving suffering. Mm -hmm. And you do this by attaining a certain understanding of the nature of reality uh, through the enlightenment experience. And early on, the idea was the best way to do that is in a secluded monastic community where each person is doing this for himself or herself, but you do this uh, in a structured communal environment. Now, as you get into the modern era, then this changes, and uh, with modernization, of course, uh, not everybody can take off to the monastic communities. Uh, in Thailand, for example, the uh, ideal is still for every male to spend some time 
in a monastic community. And uh, this is meritorious. You build up merit for yourself and for the family as you do this. But not everybody's expected to stay there. You'll spend a year, a couple of years, then go back to school or go back into business. But so it's like least, military uh, service for a country. Uh, in a way, you yeah. can think of it that way, yeah. yeah. Um, well, it, it, uh, let, let's talk about kind of the, just the whole approach. My understanding, as you've said, is to break the cycle of, of suffering. And my, my sense is uh, probably the best way to deal with this is to deal with the noble truths, that our world is a place of suffering. That's kind of truth number one. And it's our desire that brings about a lot of suffering. So the goal is to get control of this desire. And that leads you into living in what in, in some form of conditioned existence. And you alluded to enlightenment earlier. We're not talking about, you know, a period of history like we do in the West. Uh, That's we're, right. We're, we're talking about a, a way of understanding and a, and a way of almost, um, almost a pro- the way you approach life and the way you see it. Yes. Um, I find it helpful to think in these terms, and actually the early Indian religions, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, uh, they all use the medical analogy. Uh, There's a problem in our world. Something's not right. And uh, you have to get the diagnosis correct before you can offer an effective prescription. So what's the diagnosis? What's the problem? And uh, all three of those religions begin with the idea of uh, multiple rebirths. We've had many, many, many previous lives. We'll have many, many future lives. This is not a good thing. Uh, Inherent in existence is suffering. And so the desire is not simply to have a better life next time, but to break that entire cycle that drives death and rebirth. And according to the Four Noble Truths, um, the problem is uh, tanha, Mm -hmm. or what it's often translated desire or craving or thirst. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not desiring the wrong things. Uh, This would be St. Augustine in the Christian tradition. You know, our desires need to be ordered in line with uh, God. It's desire itself, desire for anything, desire for existence, desire for non-existence. So you've got to eliminate desire, and you do that by following the uh, Noble Eightfold Path. This would be classical Theravada, uh, Southeast Asian Buddhism. Okay, and and the interesting thing here is there's, there's an embrace... If I, can, I don't know if embrace is the right word, of the idea of impermanence, that things are not permanent and that you it, – it's almost – it strikes me, and, and again, I'm, when it comes to Buddhism, I'm a novice, but it strikes me as almost being the opposite of the way Westerners are taught to think. Um, and, and whereas we like to think of order and control and, and those kinds of categories, this is almost a letting go Um and a recognition of, of the fact that there are things beyond your control. And, and then another interesting feature is the lack of speculation that exists here. This is not a theism. You don't talk about a creator God, those kinds of things. Um, you're, you're simply looking at the reality that is around you and, and trying to come to grips with the absolute lack of uh, uh, of. Of control that you have and what's going on. The only thing you can control is how you can control what you can't control. <laughs> if okay, I, good. <laughs> that's good. a that's yeah. a shot at it anyway. Um, You're well on your way, Daryl. Yeah. Okay, well, um, yeah. No, you you've hit on really the key um, metaphysical teaching of Buddhism, and this for someone raised in uh, European Amer- American traditions, especially in philosophy, where you think in terms of substance. Um, This is uh, the repudiation of that. Mm -hmm. Everything that exists is continually coming into being and passing out of being simultaneously. So a just continual flux. Uh, Nothing has a substantial enduring uh, existence. And a corollary of that, according to Buddhism, is there is no self. So we think in terms of a soul or a self, uh, 
that endures over 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, Buddhism, there is no enduring self. And uh, this is what really separated Buddhism from Hinduism, where they also believed in rebirth, but you had a soul, an Atman, which was passed on to the next life. Hmm. And according to Buddhism, at least the philosophy, what drives our desire is um, this mistaken idea that there is something permanent, there is something you can hold on to, and we keep trying to reach out for that. Hmm. And you've got to eliminate that way of thinking. It's very counterintuitive. Yeah, and, and it, it, it strikes me that it produces interesting challenges for uh, someone coming out of a Christian background to even communicate. I like to say when I'm in Scripture and I ask the question, well, where do you start with the Christian faith for someone who doesn't know anything about the Bible? And and if Acts 17 is your indicator, then you're dealing with, you know, a creator God with whom people have a relationship. Yep. Well, that can't be the starting point in relationship to a Buddhist because they don't have those categories. Um, and so so uh, what, what, what struck me in, in interacting with this is, is a different starting point. I'm going to come back to that, but that's mm-hmm. – I, I, I think it's important to stress how different – a yes. religion Buddhism is from what at least people in the West are used to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, classical Buddhism into the 19th century was unequivocal. There is no creator God. Uh, there could not be a creator God. If everything is impermanent and coming in and passing out of existence, uh, the idea of an eternal creator God just doesn't fit there. And so the more modern notion is, well, Buddhism isn't really atheistic, it's just agnostic. And uh, this is a modern way of thinking. Classical Buddhism is very clear, there is no God. And the interesting is there's a fascinating story that I, that I read that is a Buddhist story about a man being shot with an arrow, a poisoned arrow, and they're trying to figure out how to treat him. And and there are a series of questions, you know, well, I don't want to do anything until I know this and until I know yes. that and until I know this. And the way the story – and by the time you answer all your speculative questions, the man will have died. So, exactly. And, 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 so, and so the whole point of the whole story is don't go there, um, you know. Know, that that you just need to deal kind of with the reality that is around you as opposed to trying to figure out how it all unwound. Yes. Don't get – this again is Southeast Asia, Theravada Buddhism in particular, but don't get hung up on speculative, fruitless questions. You want to solve the problem of suffering. Here's the way you do it. <laughs> Yeah, so it's so it's a it's it's a moral or it's a it's a metaphysical orientation to life devoid of God. It is there's a moral orientation. There's a desire to be compassionate in the way you interact with people and that kind of thing, and be disciplined in your life. I, I think those are the features that stand out to me as I as I read portrayals of what it is a Buddhist uh, is committed to. Yes, there's a very strong moral component, and um, how do you how do you get to the place where you are able to have enlightenment and then break the cycle? Um, part of that is cultivating a, a very very strong moral uh, set of dispositions and qualities. Uh, the irony is, um, once you have enlightenment, you realize ultimately there are no distinctions between good and evil, right and wrong. But in the process of getting to that point, um, developing moral virtues is very, very important. And uh, compassion or karuna is one of the cardinal virtues. Uh, All sentient beings are suffering, and so you cultivate a sense of compassion for the suffering that is all around us. Yeah, it's, it, again, it's so counterintuitive. On the one hand, you've got this moral base, but in the end, you say there the difference between good and evil in one sense doesn't exist. That you know, to a Westerner, that goes what? Uh, uh, so uh, yes. I, I think it's I think it understanding how different this a whole approach is is actually an important part of understanding what's going on. Yes, that's right. Um, 
One of the most interesting seminars I had in graduate school was on the problem of suffering and evil. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was co-taught by the uh, Japanese Buddhist I mentioned, Abe, and uh, John Hick, a very, very liberal uh, Protestant. And they would take turns going back and forth. And to his credit, Abe was very, very faithful to the Buddhist tradition. Ultimately, there is no difference between good and evil. And of course, the uh, doctoral folk in the room are just aghast. Uh Well, surely you will condemn Hitler. And uh, Abe's response was, uh, I can say that what he did was foolish. Uh, I don't like it. Uh, It had very bad consequences, but I cannot call it evil. And most people in the doctoral seminar there were just uh, mindless. I mean, they just couldn't believe he was saying this. Hmm. But uh, he was being very faithful to the classical Buddhist tradition. Now, we're running down in time on the first segment, so this will probably spill over. But let's talk – you've mentioned uh, several times that we're talking about a particular kind of of Buddhism. uh, And I'll take a shot at pronouncing it Theravada, but I'm I'm sure I've got that wrong. Uh, You got it right. Okay. Okay. and so that's a more monastic kind of classical Buddhism, I understand. But there are others, uh, sects as well, that come in. And uh, 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 Mahayana uh, Buddhism, let's, let's briefly describe that. Yeah, very briefly, uh, this is a uh, – Theravada Buddhism is much more conservative. Um, only a few attain enlightenment. Uh, For the masses, your hope is to come back in a better position in the next life. Uh, There was a groundswell um, around the time of Christ, first century before and after Christ, uh, towards a different way of approaching liberation and enlightenment. And the Mahayana developed. Uh, It's the larger vehicle. It enables uh, liberation or enlightenment for uh, the masses. It's much more speculative in terms of metaphysics, and some forms of Mahayana Buddhism begin to treat the Buddha as a kind of godlike figure. Hmm. So uh, we can talk about more of that if you wish, but it really is quite different in some ways. Okay, and uh, yeah, we're, we're running down. Let me mention one other thing while, while because you've mentioned uh, coming back to life. And there really are different levels uh, that are viewed here. You can be, uh, you can come back as an animal world. There is a ghost level. There's a human level. There is an enlightened level. So, so this recycling, uh, this rebirth, is actually the terminology used means very something very different than Christianity is is part of where uh, the hope of people. Uh, or at least an aspect uh, of hope of people that motivates uh, the Buddhists to live as they do. And my understanding is Buddhists prefer talking about rebirth rather than reincarnation. That's right. Um, You can be reborn into different kinds of hell. There's an animal world. There's a form of ghosts. There's the human level. And then there's the divine-ish, I'm going to say it that way, level, uh, which I take it is this level of enlightenment in which you've um, loosened your grasp on on desire, um, and that's kind of the that's in an ascending order. So we've got we've got that, um, and we haven't talked about the eightfold path, which um, which I have outlined here as right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration or right meditation, same same category. So you can see there's this orientation to life that's driving uh, the way a Buddhist looks at the world by these kinds of categories. Yes, uh, and the each of those terms that you use, of course, is uh, then uh, fleshed out in, in great detail, but uh, they fall basically into several categories. One would be correctly understanding the nature of reality, and uh, and this is a uh, deeply philosophical endeavor, but it's also deeply experiential. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not just learning more information. It's um, having a certain kind of experiential understanding of the nature of reality. 
Uh, then you have the cultivation of the moral virtues, and uh, that's important to put you in the right position uh, for correct understanding. And then you have uh, actions, intentionality, which would be related to the uh, moral virtues. Uh, so yes, it's a very comprehensive <clears throat> uh, set of qualities that you try to develop. And it, it strikes me that, uh, and I, I don't want to move yet quite into what is the attraction, but it does strike me as being, in a strange, odd way, even though it says there's no self, almost a, a self-awareness part of this that is that is the attraction of it. Um, yes. Because it, it, it's trying to make sense of what's happening all around you. Yes. Yes. Um. It is a turn inward, if you want to think of it in those terms. Mm -hmm. uh, you clear the mind of uh, distractions and uh, misleading, delusory thoughts, and you turn inward to try to uh, penetrate what is actually uh, the true nature of reality. And then paradoxically, uh, when you do that, uh, you do realize the interconnectedness of everything, the impermanence of everything, and there's a kind of liberating break of the causal chain, enlightenment, nirvana. Uh, and then you, you won't come back again uh, in another life form. Let me drop another aspect of just the approach to life, but, and then we'll go back to the various kinds of Buddhism. Um, the kinds of things we talked about it being moral in its orientation, so there are certain things you're supposed to abstain from. Uh, you're supposed to abstain from harming any human. You're supposed to abstain from taking what has not been given. You're supposed to abstain, abstain uh, from sexual misconduct. You're supposed to abstain from false speech, and you're supposed to abstain from anything that clouds the mind. So alcohol and drugs are are um, are diminished as a part of your world through that kind of approach. So there's this discipline. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, that, that comes with trying to free yourself from this chain of desire? Uh, it's, it's a very rigorous discipline. Uh, and again, those would be the ideals. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at Asia today, certainly Asia in the modern era, 19th, 20th centuries, clearly uh, many Buddhist, uh, Asian Buddhists uh, don't strictly adhere to that. Right. And so there are ways of accommodating and so on. But classically, yes, it's a very strict adherence. Uh, let me push it even farther. Uh, you're not supposed to kill any living thing, not just other humans, but ideally you don't kill any living thing. Hmm. And so in the pre-modern era, this meant uh, you're a vegetarian. Right. Uh, plants are okay, but no living animal. Uh, abortion was condemned right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, not because they believe the soul was created by God. They don't believe there is a soul and there's no God to create. Right. But killing of any living thing brings negative karma. Hmm. And so killing the unborn was forbidden because uh, of the negative karma that would attach to that. Okay, you've mentioned negative karma. So that's. Uh, karma is just a word for, I guess, deeds, and there's good karma and bad karma? Uh, yeah, the uh, cause and effect, the laws of cause and effect, uh, any action uh, bears some karmic effect, positive or negative. And uh, uh, part of what you want to do in situating yourself for a better birth next time around is to reduce the negative karma and increase what is positive. Uh, so this leads to a kind of merit-making uh, within Southeast Asian Buddhism. Uh, you can build up merit giving food to monks who come around and beg, for example. This is one way of building up uh, a positive karma or merit. You know, another thought just struck me as we put kind of this this almost contradictory picture of the pursuit of morality and, uh, and an understanding of the rigor of traditional Buddhism against the idea that in the end there's no good and evil. And that is, you know, anyone who knows anything about Asia knows how um, how some of the practices related to sexuality and gender, et cetera, are, are almost without bounds. Yeah. Um, and so in a worldview like that, you can understand how that might happen. 
Yeah. One of the, uh, I'll mention that Japanese professor again, uh, I appreciated him so much because he was so honest. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a deeply committed Buddhist. Uh, and as a deeply committed Buddhist, uh, he was also committed to human rights mm -hmm. and the struggle for justice. But he was very honest. He said, it's very hard to have a platform for human dignity and human rights strictly on Buddhist principles. Huh. And then he would say, we need to learn from you Christians on this. Huh. Um, but uh, there is a paradox here, especially today, Buddhism in the West, uh, many Western converts to Buddhism are deeply committed to human rights, to uh, social justice, um, but many of them also will be very candid and say, you know what, it is really hard to uh, justify this strictly on Buddhist principles. Hmm. Uh, well, that uh, we may come back to that down the road. Let me let me quickly run through some of these sects because we want we want one of the things we're trying to communicate here is how varied Buddhism is, and that why yes. it in it, its adapting to the various environments that it's in in the various forms that it has, you shouldn't be thinking about Buddhism as a box. It's more like this huge spectrum that yes. has this approach to life at its core, and, and yet there are things pushing against that core all the time, and because it can morph, it does that. Um, yes. And so we've talked about Mahayana, and we've talked about uh, Theravada. There's also um, what's called Tantra Buddhism, which r relates to ritual magic and pushes us uh, – maybe this is a bad description – but pushes us, pushes us in the kind of direction you might see in forms of animism and that kind of thing. Yes, yeah. Uh, and Tantrism uh, is, is broader than just Buddhism. It's, it was part of uh, the North Indian uh, milieu, and so you find it in Hindu traditions as well. But uh, it is a very magical uh, approach. Occult powers um, are acknowledged, and you try to manipulate the occult powers. Um, it, it builds upon folk religious practices. And in some forms of tantrism, there's also um, use of uh, sexuality, the sexual act, as a way of trying to uh, suppress or control uh, impulses and desires. Uh, that became uh, part of or absorbed in certain forms of Tibetan Buddhism, hmm. uh, the Buddhism that went up into Tibet. Which is called, and now this I have no chance of getting right, Vajrayana? You got it right. Oh yes. wow! Okay, well, yeah. uh, um, so uh, and and we've got this is where the idea of mantras comes in the the utterances of power that come in, which sound to me almost like spells. If you were to think about an equivalent in in the West, that yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, they they will often use the word magic, but they use magic in a different way than we use it in you know magic shows. Yeah. But the idea is there are special powers and forces that you can. Um, these are not strictly speaking uh, divine powers, God's uh, acting, but they're part of the universe, part of reality that you can uh, manipulate and learn about, and so. Uh, what we would call miracles, and mm -hmm. uh, I know at least one Buddhist scholar who looks at the resurrection of Jesus and says, ah, no big thing. I mean, that's just magic in our Buddhist understanding. Hmm. Uh, well, I don't think it is. Yeah. But it, it would be what appear to us to be supernatural acts and activities that they would say are forces and powers that you can tap into and learn how to manipulate. And again, we've got this contrast between kind of what we're used to in the West, which is we would personalize these forces and yes. and and give them uh, give them a personality. We talk about spirit beings and that kind of thing. But you're really dealing with what impersonal forces, unseen forces. Would that be the way to think about it in a Buddhist mindset? How would they view these, or would they? In, in high religion, in high religion, they would be uh, impersonal forces. Uh, that you can uh, learn how to manipulate and so on. Among the masses, the folk uh, religion, uh, they are personalized. 
Hmm. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about the differences in Buddhism. Uh, with Mahayana Buddhism, as it moves into uh, t- Tibet, China, uh, Korea, Japan, and so on, um, the local deities become absorbed. And, and the ancestor the worship, I take it, would also be a part of this as well? Would that be, would get absorbed in as well, the role of ancestors? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the role first of part. ancestors. Would this also yes. become a part yes. of it? Because that's big yes, in indeed. Asia. That's right. That's right. Uh, when Buddhism got into China, it realized immediately uh, there was a problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, the monks are celibate. China is a heavily family oriented society. Hmm. And uh, you're suspicious of uh, celibate uh, males. And so one way that Buddhism adapted to the local ethos was to become very family friendly and begin to perform uh, funeral rites and rituals. And so it elaborated on the ancestors as uh, Buddhas or Bodhisattvas Hmm. and uh, incorporated them within the pantheon. Well, well, this has been fascinating. We could actually probably do the whole podcast just on the nature of Buddhism, but I do want to transition. We've already suggested a little bit what uh, what makes for adherence, and that is the way in which it 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 does attempt and to give an explanation for what's going on all around you, uh, yes. and a way and a way of wrestling with engagement of what is oftentimes a bewildering world. Yes. Uh, it, it's a, in some ways, a very cold explanation, uh, but the teaching on karma and rebirth is a very logical explanation for the uh, suffering and the inequity we see in the world. Why is one child born severely deformed, another child is perfectly healthy? Why is one uh, person wealthy and has a long, rich, full life? Uh, other people suffer all the way through their lives. Karma has a very efficient, logical explanation for that. It's a very cold explanation. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if you're looking for an efficient explanation, it works. And you're and what, by cold, I think what you mean is it's it's um, impersonal and detached. It is impersonal and detached. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, um, and, and so, so what it does is it allows someone to make make sense out of the chaos around them and as such is its attraction. I guess the next question I have is, you know, normally when you think of religion, you think of rites of worship or things like that. There are Buddhist temples. So yes. so what is happening in turn when an, when someone adheres to this belief, what's happening in the temples? What's going on there? Yeah, very good question. Um Here you have the tension, I think, uh, between the uh, philosophy, what the scholars teach, uh, what the uh, literature, the sutras uh, portray, and then how the masses of ordinary Buddhists actually live and respond. And on the scholarly level, again, with most Buddhism, there is no God. Mm -hmm. I believe as a Christian, Romans 1 and other passages, God has created us with this awareness of the transcendence and our accountability to um, a creator. Mm -hmm. And I think you see this manifest uh, in the folk Buddhist uh, response. So, although they're told there is no God and prayer, strictly speaking, makes no sense, On a popular level, many Buddhists will pray to one of many Buddhas, and uh, different Buddhas in different traditions and uh, uh, nations will be kind of treated in a quasi-theistic manner. Uh, Pure Land Buddhism is the largest form of Buddhism in Japan, and uh, the scholars will be emphatic. Uh, Amida Buddha is not a god. Uh, On the popular level in the temples, I'm convinced many of them actually are treating Amida Buddha as a kind of deity. And they will come and they will pray and ask for uh, Amida's help in this, that, and the other thing. So if you're engaging with the Buddhist, and now I am transitioning kind of out of adherent status, Christianity speak into all this, I suspect that there really is... Um, some just general listening that has to start off with you kind of get the person located as to how they view 
their their Buddhist faith, what they see themselves as doing if they participate in temple, and those kinds of things. It, it, it may take a while to get, get, get located with where that person is coming from in terms of the way they view their Buddhism. Yes. Uh, traditional Asian Buddhist, it takes a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you start a Bible study, Genesis 1, or to pick a New Testament text, uh, in the beginning, God. You have to stop right there and talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you mean by God? Who is God? And uh, the Japanese pastors are very, very good, very patient. And they just keep coming back to this until you really appreciate the idea of a creator God. None of the rest of this is going to make sense. Right. Yeah. It's, but, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, um, there are very different religions, but there are natural points of contact and uh, resonance. And um, uh, Buddhism in Asia has become very closely aligned with uh, the arts. Hmm. Uh, so it's a very aesthetic religion. The temples have beautiful gardens. Uh, calligraphy, Chinese and Japanese, has Buddhist origins, a tea ceremony, poetry. Uh, much of the uh, literature picks up on allusions to the transitory nature of life and so on. Much of this is really beautiful. And uh, I have found uh, certainly Japanese have an appreciation for the book of Ecclesiastes that many Americans don't. Mm -hmm. We don't know what to do with this book. Mm -hmm. Uh, They like it. The language is something they resonate with. Mm. Uh, And, of course, in Ecclesiastes, uh, at pivotal points, you have God. Mm -hmm. Remember your creator. And so that puts it in a totally different light. Uh, But there are points of contact and resonance there. And it also strikes me as uh, there are two themes that I think are particularly – particularly connectable, if I can say it that way. The whole teaching about suffering um, yes. is something that the Scripture recognizes. We, we would call it a fallen world. Yes. Uh, and and so, so there's that dimension. And then the whole movement towards care and compassion for people around you, uh, yes. which, interestingly enough, introduces the possibility of talking about who people are as made yes. in the image of God, which yes. gives them value. But yes. in the context of Buddhism, it's hard to know how they would talk about anthropology. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, you have actions, but no self that performs the actions. You have suffering, but no self, soul that uh, suffers, and so on. Uh, I think compassion and suffering are two areas uh, in particular where we can uh, identify and resonate. Uh, there's much in the words attributed to Gautama about suffering that I find very, very moving. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was a very astute uh, observer of uh, human nature and the human condition. Uh, The big difference is what is the cause of suffering and how do we overcome suffering? Mm -hmm. And there, if you go back to the diagnosis uh, analogy again, uh, scripture has a very different diagnosis of suffering than does Buddhism. And if you look at Jesus and how he approaches suffering, it's very different from the path that Gautama the Buddha in called. In fact, it strikes me as this is another area of huge contrast, because in, in Christianity there's a recognition of our responsibility within suffering, whereas my sense is in Buddhism, a person's uh, this may be an oversimplification. They're almost a victim. I mean, they do have these desires, but it's it yes. it surrounds them and almost overwhelms them. And the issue is getting out of the overwhelmingness of what is surrounding yes. you. Yes. Um, historians and scholars uh, have rightly noted that there's a kind of passivity that seems to come along with uh, Buddhism. Now, modern Buddhism is working hard to uh, challenge that and combat that in social justice and human rights. But there is a kind of passivity and acceptance of, they would call it karma, in other contexts you would call it fate. And it's, it's in the language, Japanese language, the idioms that are used, there's almost an acquiescence, well, what can you do, this is the way it is. Hmm. Well, this, uh, this has been an incredibly fascinating introduction to Buddhism, uh, and uh, I find, uh, I find uh, it's almost so opposite uh, 
that uh, it, it's intriguing the many ways in, if I can say yes. it that way. Um, yes. And and so uh, I, I could see a very interesting conversations taking place between people who are Buddhists and Christians uh, on certain themes in which there could be both connections and yet the angle at which that issue yes. has been tackled is so distinct that it, yes. that for people who are curious on both ends, there would be an interesting conversation to be had. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not a short conversation. You have to listen to the other, uh, define terms, enter someone else's world, even as a Buddhist has to do that, listening to a Christian. Yeah. Well, Harold, I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of walk us through this territory. It's vast. As I said, there are many, many Buddhists in the world. Um, the only thing that's probably a little odd is that most people who live in the West have not had much encounter with Asian society, et cetera. So it's a completely yes. new world for a lot of people, and you've really helped us to kind of negotiate our way through. So I really appreciate you being with us. Well, thank you, Daryl. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And we thank you for being a part of the table, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.